Well, hey, it's great to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be back in the saddle. Uh, was it, it was Bruce that preached last weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, he did a phenomenal job. I'll tell you what, it's amazing how he preaches and then leaves the state. <laughs> added protection. He did a great job. He did. He did a fine job. And uh, this morning, we're going to continue in our study through Job called Sovereign Suffering. We just have a handful of these left, just a, just a few more. In uh, chapter 40, verse 8, all the way through chapter 41, verse 34, that's the whole chapter of 41. We know and we learned a couple of weeks ago that this is, this is where God unleashes or unleashed His most devastating correction against Job, which finally leads Job to full repentance. Since Job had implied that he could replace God and do a better job of running the universe, God challenged him to prove that he possessed seven essential attributes, the very things that one would need to be able to do this job of running the universe. In chapter 40, verses 1 through 14, we looked at the first six, and like I said, that was a couple of weeks ago. If Job could demonstrate that he possessed omniscience, that's all knowledge, omnipotence, that's all power, sovereign authority, uh, deity, that he could, in fact, uh, exhibit or, or show that he's, he has godlike features or that he is God, if he could demonstrate that he has the attribute of perfect justice as well as divine judgment, if he could de demonstrate that he had these attributes, then God would acknowledge that Job had the ability to deliver himself from his own calamity and, of course, run the universe. And uh, back in chapter 39, God tested Job's knowledge and wisdom of the animal kingdom. If Job is going to run the whole world, he's going to need to have all these attributes. He's going to need uh, to possess a full knowledge, a full intimate knowledge of all the animals uh, as well as everything else, but in particular, in, in that chapter, in chapter 39, he, he needs to know all the animals so he can take care of them and rule over them. Now, in the next section, which is chapter 40, verse 15, all the way through the end of chapter 41, that'd be verse 34, God comes back to this subject of, of animals. But this time, He describes two of the most powerful and dangerous beasts on earth. And we're going to divide this section into two parts because there's a ton of material here. We've got 44 verses. You know that's not going to happen in, in one sermon. So we're going to break it up into a couple. Uh, this morning we're going to begin to look at the seventh and final attribute that Job needs to be able to do the job. And we're going to look at the first beast that God mentions here. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 40. So we need to pick up. Uh, where we left off on the fifth, and we need to move to our seventh and final attribute. And number seven would be this. Uh, God is, is asking or telling or commanding Job to demonstrate that he possesses sovereign control. That's the final attribute. And we do see this in, in chapter 40, verse 15, all the way through the end of chapter 41. That's where this is contained. The, the, the remaining chapter that we're in and all of the next chapter deal with this one attribute of sovereign control. And of course, we're only going to look at the first portion of it today. Let's pick it up at verse 15a. Here's where God goes next. Again, He returns to the animal theme, and He says in 15a, Behold, behemoth. Stop there. God challenges Job to demonstrate his ability to exercise sovereign control over what some theologians call here monsters. Behemoth, like it's a monster. Leviathan in the next chapter, like it's a kind of monster. Now, when we think of monsters, we think of Monsters, Inc., we think of Disney, we think of Whatever it is, we don't typically think of monsters actually existing, but some theologians say that God is now challenging Job to show that he can control monsters. And the first of these quote-unquote monsters is behemoth. <clears throat> we see that right here in 15a. And then the second is Leviathan, and we see that in chapter 41, verse 1. As I said, we're going to focus on behemoth today and Leviathan in the week following week, Lord willing. Now, there is a ton 
of speculation as to what Bohemoth was or still is. There, there are so many theories on this. By the time you're done reading five or six of them, you're like, I, I don't even care anymore of what Bohemoth is. And, and the word Bohemoth is interesting. It's a transliteration of a Hebrew word, which means super beast. So that's one way that you could render behemoth here. You could just, you could just call it in English a super beast. Now, now, what does that make you think of? Godzilla, right? Super beast. What is a super beast? And that's what it is. Now, some say that this transliteration isn't, necessary, isn't necessarily derived from a Hebrew word, word but an Egyptian word. But I, I, don't, I don't see that here. I don't see that here. Now, so some would classify this animal under some kind of super beast, some kind of creature, some kind of monsters. Others would identify it as a hippopotamus, a rhinoceros, or maybe an elephant. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, I think hippo hippopotamus probably fits the best. Uh, in, in, in fact, I'll take it even further. The transliteration of a Hebrew word, um, some would dovetail it or parallel it to the actual word hippopotamus, which in Greek means river horse. Hippopotamuses are typically called river horses, even though they must be the fattest horses on earth. They're big. Still others are suggesting or have suggested that uh, this, this word here, it relates to a mammoth, uh, like a, a super type of elephant or some other kind of dinosaur. And some have speculated that maybe the brontosaurus is in view here. Now, I think that those who suggest dinosaur here, um, which I don't think is a, a terrible suggestion, although I, I, the text doesn't really fit dinosaur, but I think there's a, a, a motive for that. And the motive is this. If behemoth and leviathan are actual dinosaurs, then that places dinosaurs during the period of Job, which is under 5,000 years ago, which would do what? Support a young earth theory, right? So, so the real motivator there is I want to prove that the earth is young, and I think the scripture does it without the presence of dinosaurs, right? If you just take each literal day in creation as a day, you know it's a young earth, you know it's probably six to 10,000 years old, but some of them are saying this is a dinosaur, why? Because it's a dinosaur? Well, no, dinosaur doesn't fit the description that we're going to read, but because they want to prove a young earth theory. So that's, you know, you, you don't want to take scripture ever and, and isogetically layer your own meaning onto it so it arrives at your conclusions. You need to study it for what it is and take it at face value. And so if we do that here, we kind of land differently. But some say, oh, this has got to be a Baronosaurus. Um, there are those who even would say that behemoth was a type of mythical creature. What is a mythical creature? Uh, think of uh, Medusa. Uh, think of a cyclops. Think of a minotaur. Those are Greek mythical creatures. What do mythical creatures do? They're mythical, so they don't exist. Okay, so some, some take, some take this, the rest of this chapter and all of chapter 41, and they take it allegorically that we're, you know, God is, is raising up the point of some kind of known myths about mythical creatures in Job's day that they would have been aware of and afraid of and, and these sorts of things. And I, I don't know. I don't know about that theory. I, I just don't think it works here. In fact, myth, mythological creatures were very popular in the ancient Near East. Of course, you think of the Greeks with their almost a pantheon of gods that were hybrids between human and animal, and there's just all sorts of mythical stuff going on there. Uh, the basilisks, that, that would be another mythical creature. And, and believe it or not, a great many Greeks thought they were real creatures. So um, kind of like today, people believe in all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, so there's the, the, the mythical idea here. Now, the thing is that the same Hebrew word appears in other places in the Bible. We see it in Deuteronomy 28, verse 6. We see it in Isaiah 18, 6. We see it in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 17. And it, it, in those instances, it is translated into English with the word beasts, just beasts. Uh, in those texts, it is always referring to uh, animals of the wild with no particular species in mind. So now we know that behemoth can be kind of a universal term for regular beasts. So that kind of maybe modifies a little bit of our interpretation of what we're looking at here. Um, so 
what is behemoth? Is it a dinosaur? Is it just a regular animal that we're aware of? Is it a mythical creature? Well, honestly, and my view was not this before until I studied this text, and isn't that how it works? You have a perception, and it's borrowed from sound bites from people that are you know, saying things about stuff, you, it answers in Genesis and all that, so you get a theology that's based on what people are saying, but after I studied the text, I'm pretty much sure it's a hippopotamus. Sorry to let the air out of your balloon there. I, I think the text, when we study it, you'll see that that is the best fit of all the fits. Uh, in case in point, this animal rests under lotus plants. They grow to be about five to six feet tall. I don't know how a brontosaurus gets his butt underneath one of those. So uh, there's just a zillion examples in here that just don't fit with dinosaurs. But So I think it's probably a hippopotamus. In fact, uh, I found that several other English translations of the Bible actually use the word hippopotamus here instead of behemoth. You probably didn't know that, did you? The Living Bible, it's called the TLB. It says in verse 15a, Take a look at the hippopotamus. Uh, the contemporary English version, the CEV, it says, I created both you and the hippopotamus. <clears throat> now, these are not uh, versions of the Bible that we usually use, and I'm not discounting them, but they're versions of the Bible. Uh, I think it's the, uh, the new live version or life version, actually, I think is what it is, the new life version, the NLV it puts it like this, see now the hippopotamus, which I made as well as you. Uh, if you look at the footnotes on verse 15a in the Amplified Bible, which is another English translation, it's pretty solid in some places, and then you're like, really? In other places. Um, it says this in the footnotes, although behemoth cannot be identified with certainty, like absolute precision and certainty, the biblical description seems most like the hippopotamus. In Job's day, it was commonly found in the lower Nile River and may have also existed in the Jordan River. So there's the footnotes there. And then, of course, you know, I, I'm a researcher, I'm an investigator, I got to know. And so I, I wanted to know what theologians were saying. So I looked up a whole bunch of different commentaries to find out what their perspectives were. And the guys that, that I researched all think it's a hippopotamus. Uh, Steve Lawson wrote, some scholars believe it may have been a dinosaur or an elephant, but it was probably a hippopotamus. The description of the animal supports this view. Another trustworthy commentarian or theologian, Robert Alden, his commentary on Job is phenomenal, probably one of the best. He says, the hippopotamus has been the most popular identification of the behemoth, with the elephant as a distant second. A few consider it an animal now extinct. Some view it as totally, a totally mythical animal. The details of verses 17 to 18 do not accurately describe the hippopotamus, but the rest of the verses do. And then, of course, many of you are familiar with Warren Wearsby. He's a pretty good guy. He said, Job has not yet repented of the way he talked about God. So God takes up the questioning again and this time focuses attention on two great beasts, the hippopotamus, behemoth, and the crocodile, leviathan. Isn't that interesting? So he, he identifies the first one, the behemoth, as, as a hippopotamus, and then the leviathan as a crocodile. And then another good one is Francis Anderson, another very good commentary. The details given allowing for exaggeration, because I think there is some poetic exaggeration in both texts. He says, allowing for exaggeration and also for many obscurities in the text fit the hippopotamus the best. And then lastly, probably the best of this group of theologians would be the old Puritan Matthew Henry. He said, most understand it of an animal well-known in Egypt called the river horse or hippopotamus. This vast animal is noticed as an argument to humble ourselves before the great God, for he created this vast animal, uh, which is so fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop there. So there you have you have some, some good explanations and support of the idea of hippopotamus from some pretty trustworthy uh, men. Now, we always want to get our theology and answers from the Scripture itself, but that's how those men arrived at those conclusions. They studied this text. So we're going to keep looking at this to try to figure out what's going on here, but we don't want to miss the purpose of the text. It's not for us to figure out what behemoth is. There's a, a broader purpose here than that. Now, God 
mentions or mentioned nine things about the behemoth in the remaining text, in the rest of the chapter. And I want to move to verse 15b, and this is where we see these descriptions now. Verse B, God says to Job, okay, he says, behold, behemoth. Now he says, which I made as I made you, which I made as I made you. So the first thing that we are told about the behemoth is that God made him or the behemoth just as he had made Job. In other words, behemoth is a fellow creature like all the other animals as well as human beings. What does this detail here in verse 15b, what does it do? It annihilates the mythological view. It destroys it because God is telling Job, this is a creature I made as I made you. So this is a real creature that exists. I don't know how the mythological people go any further. If God created it, then it's real. It's not a myth. Amen? So right off the bat, we've, we've got... You know, we've got artillery rounds landing all over this mythological camp. It just doesn't make any sense. God made it, and he, he made human beings as well. This rules out the mythological view. Now, sometimes mythological creatures are based on actual animals, uh, but they have features that are fanciful and go way beyond what we actually see in the animal kingdom, right? This is what myths are. Myths are some sort of natural, real animal, but then they add stuff to it that we don't actually see in creation. And so sometimes we have that playing out here. But at the end of the day, mythological creatures are mythical, which means they don't exist. If God made the behemoth, that means it is a real creature. Now, the same rule applies to Leviathan in chapter 41. Although I will tell you this, as we study chapter 41, there are going to be some details regarding Leviathan that sound like a dragon and all that, and there's fire and fire breathing and these sorts of things. And it's like, oh man, where do we go with this? Bottom line, God created this creature. He created the Leviathan, which tells us that they must be real. Um, and also another detail that supports the idea of the reality of this beast, not just God's word here in 15b, but if you just slide back to 15a again real quick, Take notice of the word behold. What, what does that mean? God is telling Job to look at the behemoth. How can Job look at the behemoth if it's a myth? It has to be a real creature. Behold, take a look at behemoth is what God is telling Job. Job can't look at a myth unless it's inscribed on a wall in a cave somewhere. He's, he's talking about a real animal that Job could actually look at, that Job could could go to the Fresno Zoo and see. No, not really, but it's something that he could go witness. It's something that he had seen. God is telling him to look at the behemoth. Think of and look at the behemoth. How could he do that if it's a myth? It had to be real. And not only did it have to be real, but it had to be nearby, right? I mean, I don't think that in the world when God's speaking, Job's here, and God is saying, behold, look behind you, there's a behemoth. I don't think Job would have survived that scare on top of all the other scares. But what, what he was saying to Job is that I want you to think of and picture in your mind a beast that you've seen before, that you've seen this creature, which means it had to be somewhat nearby where Job lived in Uz. Now, I think Job, and, and this is my theory, I think Job had probably observed behemoth on the banks of the Jordan whenever he traveled north. I think that's probably what happened. Or if he ever traveled down south of the Sahara, down into Africa, he would have seen him along the Nile. But that's a much greater distance. Uh, the Jordan River was about 30 miles from where he lived in Edom. So that would have been a, a faster trip. The Nile way down in South Africa or in the middle of Africa is a lot further away. Or maybe, maybe he had seen behemoth in northern Edom along the a place called the Brook Zered. It almost sounds like Jared, but it's Zared with a Z. Or, of course, as I said, he could have seen it in Central Africa along the Nile, which they still exist, by the way. Job had probably observed behemoth on the banks of the Jordan when he traveled north. I think that's probably what happened. Bottom line is, he was familiar with behemoth as well as Leviathan. And let me say why. Just think logically. 
Why would God bring up and describe to him creatures he had no knowledge of? Are you going to be afraid of something you know nothing of, even if somebody explains it very well? No. Right? And, and the, the idea here with Job is to strike him with some fear. So why, why would God, just think logically, why would God bring up some, a pair of terrifying, horrifying creatures, and Job's like, I, I don't even know what a behemoth is, so this isn't working, Lord. I'm just scared of the whirlwind right now. Right? I mean, think about it logically. He knew what these animals were. Why? He had observed them. He had seen them. And not only that, he was terrified of their devastating power and ferocity. He was. When God recites to him, he's bringing back to memory what Job has encountered or seen. And, and this is terrifying for Job. That's why this text is, is so incredibly effective. Do myths scare mature believers? No. We laugh at those things, right? But real and dangerous animals being explained by the Almighty in a tornado, would that not be a different story? That's what Job is encountering. He was shocked. He was scared stiff at this point. He's already terrified because God has now appeared to him in the whirlwind and is rebuking him. Now God is bringing up two fierce beasts that Job knows about that already scare him. So he's just multiplying fear here. This is a real animal we're talking about here. Verse 15c, more descriptions. He eats grass like an ox. Stop there. So the second thing we are told about the behemoth is that he does eat grass like an ox. Uh, not only does he eat grass, but he does it like an ox or like a cow. Now this description fits most of the suggested candidates, right? The hippopotamus the rhinoceros, um, and I would say some dinosaurs. Uh, notice the wording again. Pay close attention to it. It doesn't say that he eats grass only. It just says that he eats it in a particular fashion, like another well-known animal, the ox. It just simply says he eats grass as the ox eats it. So this means that the behemoth might not have been a strict herbivore, an plant-only animal. It, it's not, he's, he's not telling us here, God is not telling us that this is a vegetarian animal. He's just saying he does eat grass and he does it like another animal that Job is familiar with. Because some people say, well, this has to be a strict herbivore here. It only eats grass. Well, that's not what the text says. It just says he does it in a fashion that's like something we're already familiar with. And, and so this description here fits most of the beasts we've mentioned, but it doesn't fit the elephant, does it? Because an elephant does not eat grass like an ox. It eats grass, but it doesn't pluck it from the ground with its mouth like an ox does. It uses its trunk to tear stuff off the ground and to stuff it into its mouth. So the elephant is now out. And if the elephant is out here, it's very likely out everywhere else, although there are some areas that kind of fit it a little bit. Are you, is this making sense to you so far? So I think animal, or, uh, elephants are kind of ruled out here. Uh, because they don't eat like grass like an ox. They pluck and then stuff into their mouths. Uh, but hippos do eat grass like an ox. They do it when they're in the water because they pluck it off the seafloor or the riverbed. And they do it when they go up on land. Did you know that hippopotamuses spend all their daytime in the water and then they spend all the evening grazing in the fields like an ox? They literally do. And when they're in the water, they, they eat kelp. And by the way, they also eat fish. They do eat fish whenever they can catch fish. And I've seen them eat small uh, gazelles and stuff like that, that that are in the wrong place at the wrong time. So they will eat meat. And I'll tell you what, they've got those ivory tusks. You don't want those coming down on you. But I think hippopotamus fits really well here. Verse 16, behold his strength in his loins, in his loins and his power in his muscles, in the muscles of his belly. So behold his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. I'm sorry, it's, every time I read that, I get tripped up. So the third thing that we are told about the behemoth is, is that he has some serious physical strength and it's in his loins. What are the loins? Well, usually when we think of loins, I won't say what we think of. Here it means lower back. This is lower back. And then it, it, God describes the powerful muscles in his belly. Now, these descriptions fit hippopotamus, fit rhinoceros, and 
possibly some dinosaurs. And whenever I mention dinosaurs, I say possibly because we really don't know a whole lot about them. We have skeletal remains that people have built models after that may or may not even look like the actual dinosaurs, right? We don't have a lot of information on them, so it's really hard to nail anything down as a dinosaur. But I think it fits the hippopotamus really well. And even the, the rhinoceros here, uh, Albert Barnes, who's another great theologian, guy has been dead for a long time, he totally rules out the elephant. He says this, uh, the elephant is vulnerable in the area of its underbelly while the hippopotamus has strong muscles there to protect him. So elephants do have a thick hide. It's a very durable hide, but their underbelly, their belly section is pretty weak and vulnerable. And if you've ever seen any animal attacks on them, like lions, they're usually going for the gut or around the joints of the legs because they're weakened there. So the elephant really doesn't fit here with all this belly and lower back power, but the hippo fits it marvelously. Verse 17, and, and this is the one that people get tripped up on. This is where they say, brontosaurus, has to be a brontosaurus. It's got to be a dinosaur. Pay attention to the wording very carefully. Verse 17, he, speaking of behemoth, makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. Stop there. Soon as somebody reads about this particular animal having some kind of cedar-like tail, they immediately say, okay, the, you know, the elephant has a stringy tail, it can't be him. The hippopotamus doesn't have a very impressive tail, it can't be him. They all interpret this in the wrong way, thinking that he's actually describing the tail itself, but God is not describing the tail. He's describing the animal's ability to stiffen its tail, not the tail itself. You understand what I'm saying? See, we, we misinterpret this because we think that, oh, it's got to be this big tree-like tail. That's not what the text says. It's not at all what it says. It says he has the ability to make his tail stiff like a cedar. And then it says the sinews of his thighs are knit together. It does not say that behemoth's tail is like a cedar tree, which would be... If this were the case, that would mean that we're dealing with a really, really large, powerful dinosaur here. But the size of the tail is not mentioned. The focus is on the animal's ability to stiffen it. That's it. That's the detail. Again, if we want to layer meaning onto here to support some kind of idea of dinosaurs being around in Job's day, thus supporting our early, you know, our young earth theory, then this is the way we're going to go with it. But this is not what the text says. Uh, Bob Burridge uh, got decent, some decent commentary from him. He said, the comparison to a cedar has nothing to do with the tail's size or shape. It has to do with its rigidity. The way it moves is like the firm cedar. Rather than being just a draping tail, it has the ability to stiffen out like a tree. Now, that's a a great commentary on what's being said here. Now, these descriptions, and this is what's going to be astonishing to you because this is something I didn't know, these descriptions seem to rule out every candidate that we've discussed so far except for the hippopotamus. It rules them all out except for that one, and again, I have to say maybe some smaller dinosaurs, but we just really don't know for sure. As I said earlier, the elephant's tail is like a rope, and it remains that way at all times. It's always a string hanging off his backside. The rhino's tail, and uh, this is an interesting little bit of study I did, the rhino's tail is almost like a dog's tail without the fur. He can roll it up as a dog can, and he can straighten it out. But its density and firmness is always the same. It's always the same. It can be curled or straightened, but the firmness is always the same. Now, here's the interesting detail I was unaware of. The hippo will stiffen its short, thick tail like a two-by-four when it feels threatened. Did you know this? I didn't either. I didn't either. Barnes, again, Dr. Barnes tells us this detail fits the type of tail associated with the hippopotamus. Very interesting. And... Remember, there's another description here. The behemoth also has sinews in his thighs that are knit together. What, 
is God referring to here? He is referring to the animal's stockiness and sturdiness. That's what he's talking about. This beast is stout, muscular, and low to the ground. Okay, we can't be thinking of elephants here because they are very high off the ground. Their legs are six, six seven feet tall. A, a, a full-size male adult elephant stands over 13 feet in total height. We don't have a short, stocky beast with an elephant here, so that doesn't fit. And then I guess in some ways, according to the descriptions we do have, and I don't know how accurate they are, but dinosaurs like the Triceratops, maybe the Stegosaurus, they might actually fit here because they were stocky and low to the ground. If they were still around in Job's day, we don't know that for sure, but the hippo and the rhino both fit this description very, very well, especially the hippopotamus. Verse 18, listen to this description. And I think God is just multiplying Job's fear here as he unpacks this powerful beast. Verse 18, the behemoth's bones are tubes. They're not, it didn't say they're like it. They are. They are tubes of bronze. And he says his limbs are like bars of iron. Okay, so the fifth thing we are told about the behemoth is that his bones are like tubes of bronze, his limbs are like bars of iron. This verse deals with the animal's bone density, bone strength, not its physical size. Notice again, the size is not mentioned. Only the strength of its bones is mentioned here. So we've already learned that the exterior of this beast is, is, is almost like armor plate, right? Verses 16 and 17 kind of tell us that the, the flesh of this animal is, is, is like armor plate. It's thick and it's very strong. And now we're seeing that its interior or skeletal system, especially its limbs, they're as hard as steel. They're as, as hard as bronze, and bronze is a very hard alloy. These descriptions fit all of the candidates, I think, the hippo, the rhino, uh, the elephant, and probably some dinosaurs. So we've got a universal thing here because all of those animals have extremely dense, strong bones, bars of iron. Although I did think of the T-Rex with its little... Yeah, I don't know what these things were for, so I don't see how those, are, how those work for the T-Rex, right? I mean, he's got some impressive hind legs, but the front ones are like, hey, I can't pick this up, Fred. I don't know what to do. Can you hand this? I mean, they just... So I don't know how those fit, and that some think that we're dealing with a T-Rex here. And it's like, the, the, the top arms aren't impressive. I feel like I could pick one of those off and floss my teeth with it. Verse 19... Another description here, he is the first of God's works, or the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword, exclamation point. The sixth thing we are told about the behemoth is that God created him, uh, and we know that he created him with, along with all the other animals, and he created the, inse uh, the insects. So basically what God is saying here is that I created this beast, but it's one of my first works. And if, if you read Genesis 1, you know that behemoth and leviathan and all the other animals and the birds and the fish and the insects and all the entire animal kingdom including the insects it was created before he created man so behemoth is in that category which are the first of god's works but i think it's kind of goes a little bit beyond that in other words um uh, another thing here, being the first of God's works, I think has to do with the ruggedness of the animal. I think that's one way to look at it too. Okay, so, so this behemoth is not only, it came before, it was created before man, but it is among God's first works in, in terms of how rugged this animal is, how tough this animal is, is how fearsome this animal is. Um, how dangerous this animal is. I think that that's also a way to interpret this verse. Now, the ruggedness is an important detail here, or the longevity, right? So if you think in terms of this is one of God's first works in terms of ruggedness and its ability to self-sustain and to survive and to, and to live on through all the centuries and through the millennium, right? We're talking about ruggedness here, its ability to survive. If that's the right way to interpret what God is saying here, then what does that say about the dinosaurs? Are they still around? No, they're not around. 
So are the dinosaurs among the first of God's works? They are in terms of created order, but are they in terms of lifespan and ruggedness? No, because they're gone. If they were among God's first works categorically in that realm, then we, you know, we'd probably be battling a T-Rex on McHenry right now, right? But thank God it's going like this while we're throwing, you know, right? I mean, we get that's stupid. Think about it. The dinosaurs are extinct. They're gone. They might be in, in the category of among the first works along with all the other animals, but they're not among the first works in terms of survivability. So this description here, I think, rules out all dinosaurs because they're gone, they're extinct. But we still have hippos, don't we? We still have rhinos, don't we? We still have elephants, don't we? And, of course, we still have a lot of myths, but I don't think that works. In fact, hippos, rhinos, and elephants, think about this. They have been with us since day six, and they're still here. What does that say? High level of survivability, right? They're very durable. They're very rugged. They're still here. They withstood hunting and predators. <clears throat> Not that there are many predators that mess with hippos and rhinos, but they're still here. They're among God's first works. Now, after describing the incredible power and, and nearly impenetrable flesh and bones of the behemoth, just how strong this beast is, eh, God declares in verse 19b that He alone, speaking of God, God is speaking of Himself first person. He's saying, I alone, the maker, could attack and kill this beast with a sword. That's what He's saying. Let his maker come at him with a sword. So God is now talking about this beast and talked about its fierceness and its strength and its power. And God is telling Job, would you dare attack this thing with a sword? I could and I could take it out. That's what he's telling Job here. Now I want to talk about uh, the hippo a little bit more here. More details since I put in an enormous amount of work on this. I felt like an animal expert this last week. Seriously, I mean, I want to know what I'm dealing with here, so let's talk about it. I want to talk about the hippo primarily because I think that it is the behemoth. And I don't have some kind of, like, oh, Phil has a real place in his heart for hippos. I don't think about hippos, so I'm not motivated by, like, if it's the hippo, it does this for me. If it's a dinosaur, it supports my, my young earth theory, right? You know, I, I don't have any kind of, there's nothing here guiding me. I always thought hippos were very cute, Right? After this, I'm like, I, these things are terrible. So, so I want to talk about it because I think that's what God is talking about here. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen, we're, we're talking about strength, power, fierceness, ferocity. That's what we're talking about. Have you ever seen a hippo, um, let's see, have you ever seen an adult hippo in the water per se attack and kill some poor animal that got too close? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen it on TV? I know you haven't seen it in person. You're like, we've never been on a safari, Phil. Come on, be relevant. Have you ever seen it on TV? Have you ever seen what it's like? It's, it's absolutely terrifying, the violence. Just the, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a gory, terrifying scene. I've seen like, you know, like an animal get chased into a pond by a, a, you know, a pack of, or a, 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 some lions. Uh, what, are they, what are they called? Uh, they're not a herd, they're not a pack. Pride, thank you, a pride of lions. Have you ever seen some poor creature get chased into the water? I actually saw a video one time where, where I think it was a cheetah or a leopard, some big cat chased some like impala into a pond, and then all of a sudden the gators were coming, and it's like, ah, it's trying to get away, and then it swims right into the middle of a bunch of hippos. And I figured, well, they're cute. Oh, man, it was like, I mean, they just ripped this animal to just shredded it into pieces it was horrible it's a gory and terrifying scene so so it is a fierce dangerous beast and and not only that it's a big beast an adult hippo can weigh up to eight thousand pounds that's about half the weight of a full-size bull elephant but eight thousand pounds that's i don't know 15 toyota priuses I, I, maybe two or three of them those batteries are probably heavy this is the weight of like three cars, 8,000 pounds. And I've seen this in videos 
Uh, an adult full-size hippo, of course, in the water at this point. I've seen them toss five, 500 to 1,000 pound crocodiles through the air like a lawn dart. Literally, they'll pick up a crocodile that gets too close, shake it around like a dogwood, and then throw it 20 feet away. An animal that's 25 feet long and weighs 1,000 pounds. They throw it like it's nothing. Their power is immense. This, this, this kind of play on the crocodiles and other animals, it happens all the time in the Nile Basin. Anything that gets too close to a hippo is in big, big trouble. Very fierce, very devastating. In fact, there, there is no single land animal that can actually step, uh, stand up to a, uh, a hippo, with the exception of maybe an elephant. Elephants are pretty powerful, uh, but I think even they stay away from the hippos. But they, an elephant could probably take one out. Maybe a bull rhino, maybe. Uh, the problem with rhinos are they have the worst eyesight in the world. They really do. They, they, all they can see is the grass in front of them. So they're, they're not real good at seeing threats and these sorts of things. So there's only two animals that, in the whole world that could maybe contend with a full hippo, and that would be the elephant and possibly a full-size rhino. It takes a pride of lions, a pack of hyenas, or a bask of crocodiles to kill a hippo. They're just... None of these animals in, in a single mode can contend, not a lion or anything. Have you ever seen a lion attack a hippo? I have, but there's about six of them hanging off of him. So it takes a whole group of predatory animals to actually bring down a hippo. And of course, hippos are extremely dangerous. And an Encyclopedia Britannica article says that, and this is based on whatever gets reported, because not everything gets reported, but based on reports, annual reports, 500 to 3,000 people die from hippo attacks every year. 500 to 3,000. According to National Geographic, hippos are the world's deadliest mammal next to human beings. So this is the most dangerous mammal in the world, with the exception of us. A hippo's flesh is two inches thick. That exterior hide that you see that's kind of a purplish brown color, very slick, they actually emit an oil that is almost like a tanning lotion, or it's a, more like a sunblock. They literally have this reddish oil that comes out of them. That's why they have that hue to their skin. That skin is two inches thick. Poachers and authorized hunters, and by the way, it is illegal to hunt them unless you pay enough money and get a permit, you can do it. There are some big game people that have big money, but poachers and authorized hunters use the largest caliber hunting rifles on earth to take down a hippo. They use the 416 Rigby, the 458 Lot, the 600 Nitro Express. This is my favorite portion because I just love this stuff, but they use shoulder cannons to take these animals down because you need massive muzzle energy and you need a very, very large bullet that takes a lot of time to come apart to get through the flesh and to get through these bronze bones to reach the internal organs because that's what you have to strike with a bullet to take one of these animals down, preferably the heart or the lungs. So those who hunt hippos use cannons, the biggest hunting rifles in the world. Massive, massive power here. Now, the question is, after we've got all these descriptions regarding the behemoth, probably the hippo. Would a man with nothing more than a sword in his hands be a match for this animal? <laughs> it's just like trying to attack a, a T-Rex with a toothpick. Come on. You know, I mean, he's got this, but he's still got this. You know, I mean, you, you, what, God, this is funny. God is actually funny here. He's telling Joe, go grab a sword and go bring me back a behemoth. I mean... I can do it. Can you do it? You know, if you need to run the universe, you need to be able to accomplish this task. I can do it. Can you do it? No man in his right mind, especially one in Job's condition, because is he like an Adonis? Is he super healthy? Think of, think of the irony here. Job is, is a mortal man, okay, even in his best day. He was probably pretty strong and fit, probably looked a little bit like me, you know, just you know, you know, tough with the three chins, you know. It, 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 the guy is sick. He's near death. And God is saying, go get a sword and go bring me one. Bring me the head of a behemoth on a platter. You know what I mean? There's no way that the healthiest or the strongest man 
in the entire world could even contend with a creature like this. This mighty beast would either crush Job or any man to death with its powerful jaws or just stomp him into a pancake. 8,000 pounds. That's not going to feel good. Nobody's going to be able to contend with this thing. And that is the point of the text. It is the point. But God, the maker of the behemoth, could easily strike down such a beast. The behemoth is no match for the Almighty's omnipotent power, no match for his sovereign control. Cannot stand up. I mean, this behemoth would be nothing to God. No creature can contend in creation with its creator, right? And that's the point. Verse 20, more description. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. So the seventh thing we are told about the behemoth is that the mountains yield its food for him. And this is also in the mountains is where the wild beasts play. So this is an interesting detail. We're, now what God is doing is he's starting to talk about the habitat of behemoth. He's talked about his strength, his power, his ferocity, his, danger, dang, uh, uh, his, his dangerousness, if that's even a word I think it is. Now he's starting to talk about its habitat. And I think this verse complicates the identity of behemoth a little bit. I do. Talk about the mountains and all that. I mean, think about it. Where have you seen hippos before? Have you ever seen them in the mountains? No, they're usually in the sub-Saharan flatlands, in the desert lands, in the prairies. And the same would apply to elephants, even though there's forest elephants, but they're not in high elevation. I don't think I've ever even heard of a rhino being up in, in elevation. So this particular verse mystifies the creature's identity a little bit. The animals that we've been focusing on, they're in the sub-Saharan prairies and river valleys. And by the way, I don't know if you knew this, the vast majority of all the dinosaur fossils, they're always found in lowland regions. They're not found in mountains. They're always out in the desert. They're always out in the river valleys. They're never up high. So I don't even think back when the dinosaurs were around, there was a whole lot of dinosaurs that lived up in high elevation. So this text is like, okay, maybe we're not dealing with a real animal here. It mystifies it, but it doesn't because you've got to do your research, okay? Have you ever heard of Mount Seir, S-E-I-R? You've seen it in, Bi in the Bible, haven't you? Mount Seir, you've heard of that. It's a significant place in Scripture, and it is the biblical name for a mountainous region that runs right through the middle of Edom, E-D-O-M. That's where Job lived. So Mount Seir is a range of mountains that, that, that runs right through, almost right through the middle of Edom, where Job lived. It runs from the Dead Sea down to the Gulf of Aquaba. And Mount Seir is mentioned in Deuteronomy 1, verse 2, Joshua chapter 15, verse 10, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 42, Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 15. There's many other places that it's mentioned. That is the region. It's down in Edom south of Judea, south of, it's right underneath the Dead Sea. And by the way, the River Jordan ends at the Dead Sea. It pours into the Dead Sea on the northern, northernmost part. Now, here's another interesting detail. I mentioned it earlier, the Brook Zered. Okay, remember, I mentioned that. It's about 50 miles wide or long. I should say long, not wide, because that makes you think like, wow, is it a sea? No, it's a long brook, and really, it's more like a river and this brook, Zered, serves as the border between the mountains of Edom to its south and the mountains of Moab to its north. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 13. My theory is, is that there were hippos along this brook in this mountain region during Job's day. That's my theory. Because Mount Seir, that range is still there. The mountains aren't gone. That brook is still there. And along every brook or river or stream, there's always plants and greenery and grasses and all these things. This is the closest spot to where Job lived. And I think that back in Job's day, and I think that, you know, the animals that we see in sub-Saharan Africa were probably in a lot of other places before all this development. But I think there were hippos there. So what I'm telling you is my theory is he saw them here at this place. In the mountains, in the mountains on the brook Zered. Now, or it could be this, and here's an alternative theory, because the text says the mountains is where he gets his food, and that's where the other animals play along. But I don't think they play with the hippo, because the hippo doesn't play nice. 
Okay, so here's another theory. The text could be, and these are my theories. I didn't get these from anybody, so they're probably less valuable. <laughs> the text could be referring to the starting point of every river, every river that brings food to the behemoth and every other animal down in the lowlands, right? Where do rivers typically begin? In the mountains, right? Most rivers begin at high elevation and end at low elevation. So the water that flows from the rivers comes down from the mountains, bring in the nutrients and water that is necessary for life down below, growing all the grasses and everything along the rivers. It could be that that is what God is saying. The behemoth gets his food from the mountains because the streams and rivers flow down from the mountains and bring the sustenance or bring the ability for sustenance to grow. It could be that, and that's a pretty viable option there as well, right? So think in terms of that. I think that the text is 100% is right because it's Bible, and we're either learning here in this particular verse that this animal lived along this brook in, in Edom, in the, in the mountains of Seir, or it lived down in the lowlands along this brook or somewhere in that region where the river sustained life down below. Uh, so either Behemoth lived in the mountains called Seir on this brook, or he got his food from the rivers that flowed down from, or fl flowed down from the mountains. Both explanations fit verse 20, no doubt. Okay, so I think we're still good here. We're not deviating from the text. Verses 21 and 22. Un now here's we're getting in trouble here. It's got to be a hippo. It's got to be. Listen to this. Under the lotus plants he lies. I thought lotus plants were water lilies. They're not. They're bigger than that. And it says, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. This is, this is where he lies. This is where he finds shelter. Okay, we're talking about habitat. And it says, for his shade, for his shade, the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brooks surround him. So we're, we're talking about pure habitat. Maybe he's mountainous or maybe he gets his sustenance from the rivers that flow from the mountains. But this is a direct description of where this animal is resides this is his literal habitat the eighth thing we are told about the behemoth is that he lies under the lotus plants and seeks shelter amongst the reeds in the marsh he also finds shade under the lotus trees so there's a lotus plant and a lotus tree and he finds shade under the willows of the brook that surround him don't you find it interesting that god uses the word brook when we've been talking about the brook zared kind of interesting these descriptions really narrow down the field now. They really do. They, they, they eliminate animals that we've been trying to qualify here, animals that we've been examining. What we are being told here is that behemoth is a semi-aquatic animal that literally lies among the reeds and lotus plants that grow only in water, and, and he's a semi-aquatic animal that shades himself under the lotus trees and the willows that grow on the land. In other words, God is telling us he's semi-aquatic. He goes in the water and also resides on land. He's a land animal. He's a water animal. He's semi-aquatic. That's what we're being told here. Okay, bye-bye to the elephants. They're not semi-aquatic. There are, however, I think there's one, there's five species on earth right now. There may have been more in Job's day. Out of the five species of rhinos, there's only one that actually is semi-aquatic, and it lives in India, and it always has lived in India, which is way too far away for Job here. So we're ruling out just about every creature here, with the exception of maybe, maybe a dinosaur. But definitely we're not ruling out the hippo here. It's got to be a hippo. In fact, that rhino is called the great one-horned rhino, by the way, that's semi-aquatic. So if you want to do your own research and try to refute me, I dare you. Come at me with a sword. No, I'm not behemoth. So, so now we need to talk about details of the plants and stuff that are mentioned here because this is going to tell us about the size of the animal. We're never told what the size of the animal is, but now we can start guessing accurately. The average height of a water lotus, which is what's mentioned here, is 18 to 60 inches tall. That's the average height of a lotus plant. Okay? What dinosaurs are going to fit under that? What elephant is going to fit under that? I guess if it's lying on its back, it will, but it would drown. I mean, think about it. This is the height of this 
plant. In fact, the max height of the largest variety of water lotus is 72 inches, so that's six feet. The behemoth can stand in the water with his head just above the surface with these lotus plants just above his head. So he can stand in the water like this with the lotus plants sh you know, shading the top of his head because the lotus plant would be just above the surface of five, you know, four foot deep water. I mean, just ask yourself, which animal is going to fit into that? You can say it. The hippo. The hippo is going to fit under that and in that situation. The elephant's not going to do it. They don't even go into the water. They do sometimes. Uh, what we're being told here is that this animal is not very tall. It's not very tall because it can fit under that particular water plant. It can fit in with the reeds. It can hide itself within the reeds that don't go, grow very tall. Now, the adult rhino might fit here uh, because the adult rhino tops out at about 67.2 to 73.2 inches tall. Five to six feet tall is the max height on an adult hippo. And it, 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 it can, or, or an adult, um, pardon me, an adult rhino. So an adult rhino is a little bit taller than a hippo, so it might fit here. Now the adult hippo, it fits even better with the description here because they're usually full size, 8,000 pounds, 51.6 to 64.8 inches tall. They're very low to the ground. They're, they're not even as tall as I am. This animal could literally walk underneath the larger type of lotus plant. So I think that it, it's pretty clear that we're dealing with a, a hippo here as well, or maybe the semi-aquatic rhino, but again, they live way too far away. Now, I did do a little bit of research on dinosaurs, and like I said, it's very obscure, but uh, there aren't any semi-aquatic dinosaurs that I could find that would actually fit this description. They're either too big or just don't line up with all the other details. For example, the Spinosaurus is the first semi-aquatic dinosaur ever discovered, and of course, all they found were the bones, but it measures 15 meters long. You know how long that is? That's 50 feet, <laughs> okay? It's larger than a T-Rex. And it's a carnivore, not an omnivore. That doesn't work here. And it's one of only a handful of semi-aquatic dinosaurs. There's also another interesting dinosaur that was recently discovered called the Holshka raptor. Holshka raptor. And it looks kind of like a swan and a velociraptor mixed. It looks like something out of Star Trek D Space Nine. It's kind of weird looking. Now, it has the right size profile but it's way too bird-like. It, it looks much more like a swan than it does a velociraptor. It's got a beak, it's got wings, it's got skinny little bird legs. I mean, none of that. It might be able to fit under the lotus. It's semi-aquatic, so it probably went in and out of the water, but it doesn't fit anything else here. So uh, I, I think we just gotta rule out everything here but the hippo and maybe that special rhino that lived in India, or still does. Moving on, verse 23, behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. Um, if the river is turbulent, it would bl blast this little dinosaur that I just mentioned. Uh, this animal here, the behemoth, is, is, not, uh, is not frightened at all by the river when it's turbulent. It says he is confident, though Jordan, that's the Jordan River, rushes against his mouth. Okay, so the ninth thing we were told about the behemoth is that he is not scared at all when the river starts moving swiftly. And he loses no confidence. He loses zero confidence, though the Jordan River is mentioned here. That's a specific river that's mentioned here. When it rushes against his mouth, when it presses against his face, this animal just stands there. It's not even phased by any of this. Now, I did research. Elephants can cross rushing rivers without any sort of fear. They can do it, but they don't remain in the water for very long like semi-aquatic animals do. And remember, this animal is in the water and out of the water all the time, mostly in the water. It spends half its life in the water, half on land. Uh, the greater one-horned rhino is an, an excellent, according to research, an amazing science, an amazing swimmer, easily crosses rivers even when they're rushing and all that. 
But as I said, I think it lives too far away from Job to be the example here. It's all the way down in India and in Nepal, by the way. This is far. Now, the great horned, great one-horned rhino, it's African relatives, the rhinos that we see in Africa, the black rhino, the white rhino, all these different rhinos. They're, they have horrific eyesight, and they're the worst swimmers in the world. They can't, when they go in the water, they just go under. So you, you don't usually see African rhinos in rivers or in the water because they cannot swim. Where do you usually see them? Rolling around in the mud. Why do they do that like warthogs? Because that's what keeps them cool. They get the mud on them. It's a sunscreen. So we're, we're basically, with this description, we're ruling out several animals here. And I think we're ruling out, we've already, in a sense, ruled out the semi-aquatic dinosaurs because they're just too big to even fit the previous verse. And I think this particular verse here, regarding a turbulent river and the confidence of this beast when the Jordan is pounding against it, it we've got one option, really, at the end of the day here. Hippo. The hippo is unafraid of turbulent waters. Why? Because of its powerful stomach muscles, because of its powerful lower back, because of its thigh muscles, we learned about that, uh, because of its heavy body, because of its iron-like legs, all of these amazing, heavy-duty, super-strong features keep the hippo firmly planted in the riverbed, in the ground underneath the water, or at the below, the below the surface. They just keep it planted in the, in the torrent bed, is what we would call it. This animal, just it, just, it can just stand there in, in five foot of water with its head barely above with turbulent water pressing against it, and it has no effect. It doesn't change its psyche. It just stands there. It doesn't care. It doesn't bother it. Uh, in fact, the smooth flesh helps with this. It's barrel-shaped because hippos are kind of barrel-shaped. These features, it's flesh, it's smooth flesh, it's barrel-shaped, the chemicals that it emits out of its pores, all of these th features reduce drag, which allows the water to flow around him rather than push against him. As an airplane is aerodynamic, the hippo is water dynamic. Therefore, the hippo has zero fear of rushing waters. He doesn't get out and seek out higher ground. Now, the hippo spends about half of its life in the water, so it knows instinctively and by experience how to avoid dangerous predators like crocs. And like I said, it takes a whole bunch of crocs to take one down. Uh, it knows how to avoid other threats such as debris that's floating down the river. It, it knows how to deal with flooding. I have to be honest, I did some research on this too. Hippos are not the best swimmers. So they're counting on their girth, size, water dynamics. They're counting on all that to be able to endure what's coming at them, but they do it very, very well. You seldom hear of a hippo drowning, but they're not the best swimmers. But they know how to deal with every kind of scenario because they're experienced. It's got to be the hippo here. And I want you to go back again and look at 23b and notice how the Jordan is mentioned. Okay, why would God, this is God speaking here, why would God mention the Jordan if there were not behemoth on the Jordan? Why? Now, some scholars think that the absence of hippos along the Jordan today suggests that the actual author or the author was actually referring to the Nile. Does the text say the Nile? Could whoever the author is, we know it's God, couldn't God have said the Nile? Yeah. Every English translation but one on BibleGateway.com, which is a phenomenal resource, every English translation, with the exception of one, says Jordan. None of them say any other river. The only one that doesn't say it is the New Catholic Bible, the NCB, and it just says river. It doesn't say Jordan. So God is the author. We already learned this, chapter 38, verse 1. He said Jordan because he meant the Jordan River. He did not say Nile. This is not an allegory for some other river. It is the Jordan. What does that tell us? That behemoth inhabited the banks of the Jordan in Job's day. So Job could have easily observed these creatures, this creature 
along the banks of the Jordan if he ever traveled up to the north side of the Dead Sea and went up into the area of Israel or what have you. Now, some English uh, translations, oh, wait a minute, let me back up here. It could be this, verse, verse 23b could be a hyperbolic analogy, simply just to illustrate the behemoth's fearlessness. God could be saying to Job through that verse there, if the behemoth were to stand in the Jordan and the water was rush, rushing all around it and splashing against its face and down its mouth, this powerful beast would not get scared and continue to stand firm. So we might not be talking about a literal place where the animal lived. We might be, God might be using hyperbole to show just how rugged, strong, and fearless it is. If it were in the Jordan where there are some rapids, it wouldn't even get phased. It could be that. So we're safe here. Now I'm going to say this. Some English translations, like the 1599 Geneva Bible, which is one of the oldest English translations, it make it sound like the behemoth could open its mouth and swallow up the Jordan. Read it when you get home. Okay, so this rendering in the Geneva and a handful of other decent translations, that kind of rendering makes us think of what? What kind of creature could open its mouth and drink up a river? And that's hyperbole, but which one could come close to that? Would it not have to be a dinosaur? Brontosaurus? Maybe one of the biggest dinosaurs like the uh, Patagotitan or the Argentinosaurus or the Supersaurus. These are the biggest dinosaurs ever recorded, it, it would take an enormous beast to be able to swallow up a river or even just open its mouth and just drink from a river like we pour water down our throats. And I don't think, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about those English translations. I think the ESV is fully sufficient. But at the end of the day, none of these big dinosaurs that could allegedly drink up the river here, none of them fit any of the other descriptions the hippo is the only beast that really comes close to hitting all the cylinders here. Maybe that Asian rhino, which Job probably knew nothing about because he lived so far away from India and Nepal. Last verse, verse 24. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? So this is the very last thing that God says about behemoth. God ends his teaching on this incredible fierce beast with a pair of rhetorical questions. First, can one take him by his eyes? This does not mean to attack the animal and, and like put a hook through his eyes. It means can a man, can a person with a sword in his hand sneak up on the behemoth while its eyes are open, while it's alert? That's what it means. We, and if you, you've seen hippos in the water. They sit there with their the top portion of their head above the water, right? Just right here, and their eyes are above. They're watching for danger. And what God is saying here is that could somebody sneak up on one while its eyes are open? Okay, the obvious answer is no. There's no way nobody could sneak up. No man with a sword in his hand. Nobody could sneak up on behemoth when he is peering out of the water. It's not going to happen. This animal is too alert to be snuck up on and attacked. Second rhetorical question or pierce his nose with a snare. In other words, can a man use a trap to ensnare the behemoth and pierce his nose like a farm animal, like a bull? You've seen the bulls with the ring in their nose? That's what God is asking. The obvious answer here is no. The behemoth is too alert. The behemoth is too fierce to be ensnared, trapped. It's too wild to be domesticated like a ranch animal. There's no way this is going to happen. Ultimately, what God is saying is, can a man contend with this animal at all? And the answer to the rhetorical question is, absolutely not. But God can, right? Closing. So you have to be thinking, what's... I mean, we just had a science lesson. Why? Why are we doing this? What's the point? Well, the point is this, really. If Job is going to replace God and run the universe, he's going to need to possess what God possesses, and in this particular area in Scripture, it's sovereign control. He's got to be able to control in, in his sovereign power and sovereign will. Uh, he's got to be able to control a beast such as this. And not only that, God is challenging Job to go ahead and demonstrate this attribute by either slaying the behemoth with a sword <laughs> or by trapping and domesticating it. That's the challenge here. So we don't know what Job's reaction was, but I think we know what it was. 
We know that he could not meet the challenge here because no man could. It would take an army of men to take down this beast. So what did Job do? Continued to stand there in scared silence. That's all he could do. He knows what behemoth is, and he says to himself, oh, man, okay, this is getting more crazy, God, because you know I can't do any of these things. Yeah, and I know you can't run the universe, so repent, right? So I think we would all agree that the behemoth was and potentially is a terrifying creature, amen? Even if it's just a hippo and they're cute with the little ears and the birds landing on them, right? Nah, this thing would kill you in a second. If it is, if behemoth, it was a terrifying creature according to Scripture here, if it is the hippopotamus, then it's still a terrifying creature, amen? His muscular power, bone strength, thick hide, and ferocious temperament make him one of the most formidable and dangerous animals God ever made. He is among God's first. It's hard to believe that the hippo is in that category, but it is according to this text. If even the strongest man on earth were to challenge the behemoth to hand-to-hand -hand combat, his family would be writing his obituary the next day. It would waste him in seconds. And yet, the point of the text is the behemoth would be no match for God. As I said earlier, there is no creature in creation that can take on the Creator. God wields absolute power. He exercises total sovereign control over all things, including the entire animal kingdom with its terrifying creatures, all the dinosaurs that are no longer with us, and, of course, over behemoth, which might be a hippo, leviathan, which might be a crocodile, and so on and so forth. Nothing is a match for God. That's the point. And now by way of application, I want to say this. Are we not in this very day surrounded by what we would perceive as, or at least from the text, draw the example, are we not in this very day surrounded by terrifying creatures? Let me tell you what I mean. Depraved sinners who are hell-bent on spreading their sexual perversions. It's kind of a terrifying creature, if you ask me. How about corrupt politicians who only pursue power rather than our good. It's kind of a terrifying creature when you start thinking about government. I'm not talking about one political party. I'm talking about the whole dang mess. How about, just think about this, play along with me, tyrannical governments that impose endless taxes and erode our freedoms. Is that not kind of a terrifying creature? It is. Our government every day is becoming a more and more terrifying creature as it becomes more and more tyrannical. It's a tyrannical Rex. <laughs> How about active shooters who murder innocent bystanders in grocery stores and are babies on school campuses? Is that not a terrifying creature? Yes. How about all these DAs that have been elected to office that are super soft on crime and now they are flooding our streets with dangerous criminals? It's not an attack on a political side. It's a reality that we're having to deal with. We just had the guy from San Francisco ousted because he was exactly that. Is that not a kind of terrifying creature with them releasing dangerous criminals onto our streets every day? It's only a matter of time till we're having to deal with them. Terrifying creature. COVID, monkeypox, cancer, every other imaginable disease. Terrifying creatures. Right? They are. Plummeting stock prices, caving crypto, kind of terrifying creature. How about the advancement of socialism? That's a bit of a terrifying creature. We see that happening nowadays. How about inflation? Hmm. When's the last time you bought meat? Lots of fun, huh? Yeah. Now, Cameron's a big barbecue guy. I haven't seen him buying those briskets as often because they're now like $10 million. Trade a brisket for a can of gas. Inflation's a kind of a terrifying creature. How about the war in southern Europe? That's a terrifying creature. How about Vladimir Putin? Kind of a terrifying creature. Always has been, probably always will be. How about dangerous drugs, right? We're seeing them like never before. Fentanyl. Get it on your finger, you're gone. This happens to police officers and all sorts of other workers that accidentally handle the stuff and they overdose. Heroin, meth. Addiction. That's a terrifying creature. Homelessness, yeah, to me that's kind of a terrifying creature. And the biggest one of all, the devil and the demons who constantly attack us with every imaginable temptation, some of which we give in to and create havoc for our lives and families. 
Is the devil not, in a sense, along with all his minions, a bit of a terrifying creature? You see, these terrifying creatures, I mean, behemoth, I guess it could have been a myth. I don't know. Point is, the terrifying creatures I just mentioned are real, and we have to deal with them every day. Every day we face these creatures. Every day. But our God is all-powerful and exercises sovereign control over everything. Everything. In fact, I, I would just venture to say that the speedy erosion of American society is actually God's judgment against this nation. All these terrifying creatures are examples of God's judgment against a wayward, perverse, God-hating, creation-worshipping people called Americans. The things that we're experiencing today are terrifying creatures, but they're really expressions of God's judgment against this land. God has turned the U.S. over to a depraved mind because our country suppresses the truth in unrighteousness and worships creation, sex, and all the other things rather than the Creator. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. America fits this verse, that passage, perfectly today. And I believe there is no coming back from this for America. It is too late. We have been handed over. God is not going to rescue America. But God will save His remnant. He will. He will call His people from amongst America's ranks and deliver them in Jesus Christ. He will. And He will preserve His people by His all-powerful, mighty hand. The terrifying creatures we face each day are no match for our God, even if they are expressions of of His judgment. Ultimately, for His people, He will preserve us, and nothing is any sort of match against Him. And we know this. We know that God is bigger. We know that God is more powerful. We know that God is sovereign and omnipotent and omniscient. We know that there is nothing that He cannot conquer, especially a poisoned, dead, stony human heart. Nobody can perform that miracle but Him. We know these things about Him. We know that America can be prolonged and preserved for, for another season because of His power. We know this. We know that He can preserve us, and so we pray. Amen? We pray, and we pray, and we pray without ceasing. We do this. And not only do we pray without ceasing, we rejoice, and we thank the Almighty for what He has done for us in Christ and we thank Him for His preserving power. And we thank Him for what He will do in the future. When that trumpet sounds and the glory cloud descends, Shekinah, and King Jesus appears with myriads of angels to call us to Himself and to destroy every adversary and to establish His throne and rule on earth forever and ever and ever. Amen. We rejoice and thank Him for that because there is an end coming to this madness. Peter told his audience on the day of Pentecost, he said this, save yourselves, after preaching the gospel, save yourselves from this crooked generation, Acts 2.40. And this should be our message to our audience, the people of this fallen world. And some of these people are these terrifying creatures. That should be our message to them which should be followed by a description of the way of salvation, the gospel. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous because we have all sinned and transgressed God's commandments. We've broken His laws, but, but Jesus Christ lived a perfect life to earn our righteousness. He died on a cross to pay for our transgressions and sins. He was buried and He rose from the grave victorious over sin, Satan, death, and hell for all who repent of their unbelief and put their trust in Him alone. That is our message. Save yourself from this wicked, perverse generation. How do I do that? By repenting and believing the gospel. It's actually God who saves you. That's our message. And if we have Christ, we have all the protection we will ever need. 
Our faith is secure in Him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He will bring it to completion. It's not going to go away. It's not going to dissipate. It's not going to be removed from us. If you trust in Christ, you will trust in Christ for all eternity because of Him. Hebrews 12, 2. Spurgeon once said, No man with genuine faith in Christ will be lost, or will lose it, actually. For the faith which God gives will last forever. On top of that, and I, I say this in light of all these terrifying creatures and, and the perversity and, and, the, and just it's the seemingly power of, of this culture and how it's pressing in on us and charging the gates of hell. I say that in light of all these things and all these fears and terrors that we, that we have to deal with and, and our own illnesses and all these things, all of these terrifying creatures that we are subjected to. Remember this, we are in the hands of Christ and the Father's hand covers Christ's hands and us who are in His hands. Therefore, no terrifying creature can snatch us from the Lord Jesus' hands. Nothing can take us away from our God. Nothing, Romans 8, the end of it, nothing can separate us from His love for us in Christ Jesus. We are preserved. We are protected. Terrifying creatures or not, they cannot harm us spiritually. They have no impact on our soul. And quite frankly, they're not going to have an impact on a great many of us physically because God will even preserve His people, not just spiritually, but sometimes physically. In fact, I'm a firm believer in that, that there are a great many times in my life where I should have suffered death through foolish behavior or an accident, and God preserved me and kept me from being destroyed by an oncoming driver, some drunk in a car, some idiot with a gun at a quick stop. Who knows how many times God has saved me from some physicality when I wasn't even aware of it. We are in Christ's hands, and the Father's hands cover Christ's hands. John 10, 28 to 30. Right there, Jesus says, nobody can overcome the Father's grip. Nobody. Trust in the Lord Jesus. Believe His promises and share the message of salvation, the gospel, with others. It is humanity's only hope. It's the only thing in the entire universe that can take a terrifying creature like some depraved sinner, of which I was at one time, and transform them into a saint, a saved saint. Amen? That is the message that we must carry.